lights are so strong here, I can't see any faces, but that's probably a good thing, because Frankie will probably be winking at me from the back there. Um, first of all, uh, I'm not here as a minister. Uh, I want to talk to you about uh, what we're here to talk about today, which is uh, fulfilling potential, uh, taking on personal challenges and overcoming them, uh, trying to get the balance right in our lives that can allow us dream and achieve, achieve those dreams, uh, while at the same time keeping our lives together, uh, which isn't always easy. Uh, and I have to say, uh, it was a huge um, privilege for me to be asked to come and speak here uh, at a conference that I think has a fantastic concept behind it. Um, inviting people to come and listen to inspirational people, uh, or at least mostly inspirational people, um, and get, getting something from that themselves for their own lives. That quote, if you, uh, if you haven't got a dream, and the end of it is, as you know, you can't, you're not going to have a dream come true, um, means more to me than you might think. Uh, when I was a child, I couldn't speak. Uh, at least I couldn't speak properly. I had a speech impediment. I had a significant stutter. Uh, and so when I was asked in our party gatherings to do my party piece, I would always sing. And that was the song I sang. Because people with a speech impediment can normally sing as badly or as well as everybody else, even though they can't speak. Uh, when I was in school, uh, in English class or in French or Irish class, when it came to reading prose or paragraphs, the teachers simply skipped me uh, because I took so long to get through sentence by sentence. Uh, and so the reason why I want to start with a challenge is that I suspect everybody in this room has their own personal challenges that they've had to overcome or they're still trying to overcome. Uh, that they are using the other skill sets that they have to compensate for, that they have built teams around them to compensate for, to, in order to do a job, to run a family, to run a home, to look after the people that matter to you. Uh, and I think it's, it's important that we recognize that at the outset, that there is no perfect person that can achieve everything, that can set their dreams and can achieve them without obstacles that need to be overcome. And so today is about trying to understand and learn from other people who have the same experiences that you do. Because I suspect there's not a single person in this crowd who goes to work every day and just wants to get through the day from nine to five. I suspect you're all here because you want to make a difference. You're optimistic about the future. You want to be the change that drives things and improves things. And you want to learn from other people who've either been lucky enough or privileged enough or supported enough or ambitious enough um, or gritty enough to do that in their own lives. I have a, a dream job from my own point of view. This week, uh, on Monday morning, I flew to London. Uh, I spoke at a, an agri-food conference in Oxford. Um, I came back. I spent a day negotiating with the Department of Finance around a, a, a long-term multi-annual budget for the Common Agricultural Policy for the next seven years. Uh, I'm coming privileged to be speaking here today in front of you. Tomorrow I fly to Boston to speak in Harvard uh, at a global agri-food summit. I come back for the first cabinet meeting of the new year, the cockpit of government, the driver of a country. Uh, next Thursday I will be traveling from the west coast starting in Rosseville. Uh, down through Galway and Clare and Kerry and West Cork to try and assess the damage, the storm damage of the last three weeks, to try and put a financial package together to help people. What a job. Meeting people, some of you might hate that job, but for me, what a privilege I have to be part of running a country, to be part of 15 people who make decisions every day to try and take a country forward. And this morning, um, I rang my wife, as I often do, uh, first thing in the morning, and my nearly three-year-old answered the phone. Uh, and she said to me, Dad, I slept in your bed last night. I'm keeping it warm for you. When are you coming home? And I thought about that conversation after the phone call. 
And all of the people that I'll meet this week and next week and this year, I probably won't have a more powerful conversation than that. And I think, and I was delighted to hear Katrina talk about the importance of family, the importance of grounding, and the importance of perspective in terms of what life is all about, in terms of success in career and public recognition of that success, uh, while at the same time, the really important things are the things that often you get taken aback by in private special conversations. The most challenging uh, period of my career undoubtedly was the first six months of last year um, as a minister. I've been lucky to be in politics for 15 years. I've had six elections, uh, and I've won them all just about. Um, but the first six months of last year was an opportunity for me to actually prove my worth in my own mind. Uh, because we were challenged, and I say we as a team in the Department of Agriculture, on multiple levels. This time last year, we were coping with a real tragedy in our department. A friend of mine and my Minister of State took his own life. Within a week of that, the Secretary General of my department uh, was diagnosed with cancer and was fighting for his own life. Within a week of that, the horse meat crisis struck where we found equine DNA in frozen burgers that had been produced in Ireland. And we had a massive media storm around it. At the exact same time, we had just launched the Irish Presidency of the European Union. And my policy role in that presidency was, outside of the, the financial and banking challenges that we faced, uh, was hugely important because I had set a target at the very outside of that presidency that we would finalize the common agricultural policy, which had been worked on for four years, which is worth over 400 billion to farmers across the European Union. And that we would also finalize the common fisheries policy, which was to be the most ambitious and sustainable change to fishing across the European Union. And so we were dealing with tragedy. We were dealing uh, with horse meat, unfortunately. Uh, we were dealing uh, with setting ambitious goals that nobody thought we would achieve during the Irish presidency, which involved me traveling, uh, I would say, to 24 of the 27 member states to try and get deals across the line. And of course, immediately after the horse meat crisis, while trying to get these things across the line outside of Ireland, we got hit by a fodder crisis where animals were starting to starve because we couldn't feed them. We had to manage that. And in between all of this, my third daughter was born. I always remember it, taking a phone call from a French minister for agriculture uh, in the maternity hospital in Cork, uh, walking out into the corridor, nurses passing me, and he was talking to me about his priorities for the CAP. And I said, Stefan, with all due respect, <laughs> my wife is about to have a fecking baby. <laughs> and we still joke about that. And so I, after that six months, um, the sun came out. We got our deals on the CFP, the Common Fisheries Policy, that is, and the CAP, and the Common Agricultural Policy. Uh, we dealt with the horse meat crisis. And actually, beef sales in Ireland and of Irish beef went up 10% last year. The reputation of our industry is stronger than it's ever been. Uh, and, uh, and we have had the most phenomenal second six months this year for the agri-food industry that Ireland has ever seen. What a year of challenges, of ups, of downs, of tragedy, of emotion, of teamwork. Um, and I want to just share with you some of the lessons I've learned from that. There are a set of rules that I think um, as leaders, whether, they be, whether that be in business, in family, uh, or in politics. Um, I think that there are some things that we can learn from each other. Uh, and these are things that, in my view, set my compass. Firstly, you've got to stand for something. 
I remember when I got elected first. Uh, I was 25, just 26. Um, to be honest with you, I got elected on somebody else's name, if I'm honest with myself, uh, in my first election, in a by-election. Following a tragedy on an emotional wave, I got elected. And I remember for the first number of weeks, in fact, the first number of months, all sorts of people were advising me, telling me you had to do this to be popular, you had to do this to get votes, you had to do this to represent your constituency. I was like a weather vane. Whatever way the wind was blowing, that's what I was kowtowing to. And within six months, I made myself a promise that I would be myself, I would set targets that I thought was right, I'd represent people as best I could, and after that, they could accept me or they could reject me. But at least they'll respect me for it. And so if you don't stand for something, if you don't have a vision for where you want to go yourself, for your family, for your country, for your political party, you're at nothing. You're a spoofer. And people won't respect you, and in the long term, won't like you either. Uh, and also, um, when you are going through difficult patches in your career, if you have an overriding goal that you are pursuing, the bumps along the way can be often easily dealt with because you put them into perspective. But if you don't have an overriding goal for, whether you want to, for where you want to go, for your business, for your political vision, well, then you will be knocked off course all the time by individual crises that for you are so important at the time because you have no overriding vision for where you're really going. And I think that is so important in business and in politics. Secondly, optimism. Nobody follows a pessimist because they don't have answers to anything. They just crib about everything. And you know, understandably, a lot of people in Ireland over the last five or six years have become very pessimistic, very cynical, very negative. And we have to work in overdrive as optimists, as people who believe that next week will be better than this week, and as people who will make that happen because we believe that we can do it. We have to work in overdrive now uh, because we are swimming against a stronger tide than perhaps was the case in the past. But if you want to build a following or build respect or a team, you've got to solve problems for people. And the starting point when you're looking to solve a problem is you have to believe it's solvable. Being optimistic in a naive way doesn't bring about solutions, but it's certainly a help in terms of a starting point. Relentless preparation. If there's one thing I've learned in politics, is always know more than your opponent about the topic that you're going to be debating and discussing. Every time you go on radio or television, always know more than the person who's going to question you about the issues that they're going to question you on. Otherwise, you're starting out at a disadvantage. And you're starting out uncomfortable because you know they, more, they know more than you do. And the same goes for business. And the same goes for conversations you have with your children, by the way. <laughs> Where sometimes you are, regardless of your preparation, aren't ready for the questions that they ask. I always remember, and uh, there's a person in the crowd here today called Katrina Fitzpatrick, who's my most important team member. She looks after my PR and, uh, and communications. Uh, and I remember we uh, together made a mistake. I was going on Vincent Brown uh, with Pierce Doherty, who's the Sinn Féin spokesperson uh, on finance. And it was before the budget. And I thought I was going on to talk about the budget on behalf of the government. And actually, I was going on to debate the Sinn Féin alternative budget for Ireland. And I, haven't e I hadn't even read the document. And we went on and debated for 40 minutes. And it was my worst ever media performance. Because I was actually debating something that I'd never seen. And afterwards, we had a shouting match, myself and Katrina, as to how we could have let this happen. She was shouting as much as I was. Uh, and we have never and will never allow something like that to happen again. So relentless preparation when you are preparing to take on challenges, when you're preparing to take on your competitors, is a must because you need to reduce the risk of the things that you can manage 
because there are so many unknowns out there that you can't. And so the starting point is do everything you can in terms of controlling what you do control um, before you go into an environment where the unknowns are difficult enough to manage without being badly prepared as well. This is perhaps the most important in work. Nobody's going to change the world on their own. I've just come from the uh, Young Scientist competition. 550 projects. I tell you what, if you want to breathe in positivity, go down to the RDS today and start talking to the young people there. They are just fantastic. Uh, and uh, and they, have, they are all teams of people developing ideas, innovation, new thinking. Many of them want to change the world. And you know what? Some of them will. Because they'll keep that spirit intact as they grow older uh, and move out of school. But for me, building a team is so important. Where do you start with a team? You start with yourself. You look in the mirror and you say, what are my weaknesses? What do I do badly? And who do I need around me to compensate for that so collectively we're stronger? And you do that and you surround yourself with people who compensate for your own weaknesses. And what else do you do? You communicate with that team all of the time. You tell them what you expect from them. And most importantly for me, you create an emotional connection with them as well as a professional one. One of the most emotional moments that I had, and this may sound strange to many of you, um, is that at, when we got the common agricultural policy over the line, the chief negotiator for us hugged me and said, Simon, we did it. And you know what was so strange about that? Because he had a tear in his eye, for starters, but it was the first time he had ever called me Simon. He always calls me minister, because he's one of the most professional people I know. And I knew then that actually what he had done uh, for, for him uh, was also to deliver something for me because he felt so close to me in terms of our collective effort and the team's effort to get this job done. In a crisis, people look to you. The leader of the team, the head of the office, the head of the family. When there's a tragedy, sometimes it's the leader in the family that is the focal point of that tragedy. And somebody else has to step up but what people are looking for is calm courage, as I call it. Nobody wants a crazy man response of shouting and screaming and anger and uncontrolled responses. What people need to know is that somebody is in charge. They know what they're talking about. They've prepared for this. They have a team to deal with this. And that they can follow that person and trust them. And that is hugely important, particularly in government, but also in leadership roles um, in, um, uh, in business. And the final thing I would say, because I'm running out of time, is love home. And I averted to this at the, at the start in terms of the power of your children, the power of your partners. Um, I think it's probably true to say that many people through the last five years have unfortunately wrecked their families to try and save their businesses. And in some cases, they've lost both. Certainly in my profession, I know people who are close to me in politics uh, who have lost their families because of an obsession with politics, with votes, with popularity, with elections. Um, an obsession that their partners and their families simply cannot deal with. And so the most important things in life are the things that when you finish your career, you still have. Uh, the people who don't give a damn, quite frankly, how successful you are or what you change or what you do or how much money you have or how many photographs you get in the paper, uh, but are the people who just want to be with you uh, because they want to be with you. Uh, and if you lose that perspective, as I have nearly done in my career, to my cost, privately. Um, uh, you will learn some very, very emotive and hard lessons. And so if there's one message that I would leave with people uh, who are driven by wanting to be successful, as I am, by wanting to change the world, or their country, or their community, or to be the next inventor or innovator, 
Don't forget what's constant in your life in terms of foundation. Uh, and I often said, and I had this conversation in the car on the way over, because I was thinking about it. If I was to lose my family, I would regard myself as a failure. If I was to lose my seat, I'd move on and find something else to do. And I think that is a, a message that we should all cherish. And I think the, the points that David raised earlier are a sharp reminder uh, to all of us of actually what can happen in sh such a short period of time that can dramatically change the direction of our lives and the lives of our families uh, and in many ways puts our businesses and our careers uh, into the kind of perspective uh, that I think is important. Uh, so thank you very much for the, for the privilege uh, of listening to me.